Welcome to Reconnect, the podcast dedicated to sharing and defending the good news of Jesus Christ. That is, Jesus died for sins, was buried, and on the third day was raised again according to the scriptures for our salvation. It is through Jesus alone that we are reconnected into a right relationship with God. Reconnect us, O Lord. Welcome to the inaugural show of Reconnect. I'm your host, Andy Rasman. I'm a world religions and Christian apologetics teacher at Crean Lutheran High School in Irvine, California. To see more of my work in these two subject fields, check out andyrasman.com or contradictmovement.com. Studying what other religions teach and preparing to defend the truthfulness of God's word play a huge component within the church's call to make disciples of all nations. But sometimes it's hard to communicate this truth in faith conversations, especially when words might have different meanings to the skeptic and to the Christian. Today's guest, Bill Foster, will help in this process by sharing with us four common types of skepticism to the Bible's message of salvation through faith in Christ. I discovered Bill by searching the apologetics section of my local Christian bookstore. His book, Meet the Skeptic, a field guide to faith conversations, popped out to me. The spine had a collection of symbols on it, a peace sign, a yin and yang symbol, a Darwin fish, and what I call the bad religion symbol. Yeah, the band bad religion, Uh, because I've seen them use this symbol quite a bit on their albums. It's a cross in a circle with a slash through it, kind of like the no smoking sign. Uh, So it's basically saying no Christianity is the way I interpret it. I was thinking, okay, these symbols must be representing different types of worldview objections to the gospel message, and since it was called a field guide to conversations, I thought this would be really good to connect with Bill to just see what these uh, symbols are and uh, how it relates to conversing with skeptics. Bill's on the phone with me now, but before I bring him in to talk with us and uh, to teach us more about conversing with skeptics, I want you to be as excited to hear from him as I am. Uh, Bill is a Christian apologist, teacher, and presenter to adult, to adult, college, and teen audiences, but this isn't what he is trained to do academically. He has a BA in English and an MFA in graphic design. While at graduate school, Bill was confronted by an array of colorful but anti-biblical worldviews for which he had few answers. So essentially, out of necessity, he had to go to the books on his own to become an informed representative of his faith, and he has immersed himself in the study of defending the gospel ever since. So I think he has a lot to offer to us in this regard, since he has come to this from personal experience and having to use this firsthand to defend his own faith, and obviously to share the good news with others. Bill has put together numerous visually driven and pop culture laced presentations to address some of the commonly heard attacks against the Christian faith, and he's been sharing these for the past 15 years at various churches and college campuses. He's also the owner of a brand image and design firm that helps him understand how the popular culture perceives and is influenced by the ideas that shape our world. Again, Bill Foster's book is called Meet the Skeptic, and his website to see more is fosteronfaith.com. Bill, welcome to the show. Thanks, Andy. It's great to be on with you. All right. Before we dig into Meet the Skeptic, I want to have a get-to-know-you question. I noticed in your book that you quoted a couple of dialogues from Star Wars Episode Three: uh, Revenge of the Sith. Uh, so I was curious, are you a Star Wars fan? Uh, I, I'm not a uh, I'm not a Star Wars geek. I guess I'll clarify it that way. Huh. Um, I do like Star Wars, um, but uh, yeah, some some of the uh, quotes just stood out uh, to me and my wife and a couple of our friends when we were watching the movie. Okay, cool. We'll we'll we'll, we'll come back to the conversation you quoted. But I'm just curious of the ones you've seen, which would you say is the best movie of the Star Wars universe? Uh, I'd have to go with uh, Empire Strikes Back. All right, how come? Um, I, I think that one was the best all-around movie. Um, I, I think the uh, I think the the last three, the, the newer ones, which are actually the the earlier ones in the series, were not very well written. And uh, but but Empire Strikes Back had a had a collection of things. There was a transition uh, piece in the movie. You get to see Yoda. You get to see more Darth Vader. That kind of thing. So uh, just thought that was uh, made made it the top one. Awesome. I actually agree with you on that. I think the special effects are up there as being better. 
Um, I just really like the end, too. At this point, it shouldn't be a spoiler because if someone hasn't seen it yet, there's probably a problem. Uh, but I, I just really love the end where it's where Luke's like, no, I, I will never join you, even if you are my father, right? And he's just like, I'd rather die than, <laughs> than join forces with you. So. So on that one, at least, he, he, he wasn't a moral skeptic, which is something we'll get into soon because that's one of the types of skepticism that you bring up. Uh, so with your book, who is a skeptic? What do you mean by this term? Okay, uh, as far as my purposes go, a skeptic would be anyone who does not have a biblical worldview. Okay. Uh, skeptics can be all flavors. Um, you know, to to a Muslim, we would be a skeptic. But uh, for us, for Christians, I would say anyone who does not hold a biblical worldview. Okay, awesome. So this is a very broad field. We could be talking about atheists, agnostics, deists, Muslims, as you said. Um, so, and churchgoers. Oh, churchgoers too. Okay, awesome. Because I because sure. I guess we struggle with doubts about our faith too, right? Exactly. Um, yeah, there was a statistic I think I have in my book uh, from Barna that only about 9% of, of the people out there believe in things like fundamentals, like um, that there is absolute truth, the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings, Satan is an actual being, uh, good works don't you get you to heaven. If they believe all of those types of things collectively, they have a biblical worldview. But a lot of people will have two or three of those that they may not fully believe even right. though they go to church and claim to be Christians. Right, so as Jesus said, narrow is the road, um, and few find exactly. it. Um, so with with that idea then, to, to help narrow our field, to make it easier for us, my understanding your book is to help us to not get into a sparring match, which I think can sometimes happen with apologetics when we're defending the faith. You answer one question, you get another one back, and you just keep deflecting back and forth. You, you found four types of skepticism, that are very common, and the idea then is to pull out or unroot the weed of the skepticism. Uh, so those types of skepticism, spiritual skepticism, moral skepticism, scientific skepticism, and biblical skepticism. And what I'd like to do is just hear briefly from you on each of these. Uh, maybe first then spiritual skepticism. What, what type of objections would be spiritual in nature? Uh, they would include things like uh, there are many paths to heaven. Um, find your inner voice. You know, follow follow your feelings. Uh, ask the universe for what you want, and it will give it to you. Um, or, or it could, and that's sort of a self made spirituality. But it can also include formal religions um, that are non Christian religions. Uh, Buddhism, follow the Eightfold Path. Islam, follow the Five Pillars. That's spirituality as well. It's just formalized. Gotcha. But those are all spiritual skepticism. Okay, good. And so with spiritual skepticism, uh, what's the best approach then in a conversation? Like you just listed some of the objections. If, if we hear those and we recognize, okay, there's a there's spiritual skepticism here, what's the best approach then like to unweed this skepticism? Right. Um, so now that so now you're speaking the same language, you're not trying to answer something they're not asking. Um, and and from there, uh, it, no one is going to have an answer to everyone's objection. So the idea is to try to get underneath that objection and say, okay, you know, you're bringing up some interesting points, but I, I think what what the big idea behind most of what you're saying is that good works get you to heaven. I mean, we can debate our religious um, ordinances and, and practices and rituals all day long, but ultimately, if I'm going to convince you, or you're going to convince me, mm-hmm. the big question is, how do I get there? 
you know, how do I get to that final destination, heaven or paradise or nirvana or whatever it is? So that's the, that's the key question, the, the root idea. Um, good works get you to heaven. Okay, awesome. And then you just got to try to pull out why that's not the case. Um, right, you would ask something like what I call a probing question, like how good is good enough? That, that would be the one that would directly address that root idea. How good is good enough to get you to heaven? If you're honest with yourself, it would have to be a much better standard than this life. Right. So just how good does it have to be? Okay, good. So it's kind of showing them the law, and as a mirror, the law is showing them that they've fallen short, even of whatever their religion's uh-huh. adherence may re- like require. Uh-huh. That's right. Pretty cool. Um, in, in your book, so, something I really like about it is that it gives red flag words for each of these types of skepticism. Um, which, like you were saying, like you hear key words and, oh, I, what does that mean? Like you actually define these uh, from these different uh, points of skepticism. And one of them within the spiritual category was organized religion, uh, which you say to the skeptic means a narrow, dogmatic, hypocritical system. And you give the example of Oprah Winfrey saying, I took God out of the box because I grew up in the Baptist church and there were rules, belief systems, and doctrines. God is a feeling experience, not a believing experience. If God for you is still about a belief, it's not truly God. And at first glance, I personally would have thought Oprah is rejecting her Baptist upbringing because of the organized religion, because of the hypocrisies she maybe saw in the church. But what I like is you point out that authority is the root problem here. Um, Could you explain that in more detail? And how would you then approach her objection knowing that the problem is authority and not hypocrisy? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think most people uh, that struggle with the authority part because, I mean, really, is organization the problem? Is it a problem that we have a budget and that we have to keep the lights on and that we meet at a certain time each week? You know, those types of things, organization, is that is that really the issue? Or is it that it's not the organization that I set up? Mm. In other words, I'm not over it. I didn't decide what these tenets, these beliefs are. So... This is some authority that I feel like is being forced on me. Um, that would be probably the way they would say it, um, whether or not it's being forced on them or not. It, I think the, the word underlying that is conviction. Maybe they're being convicted by it, and they don't like that feeling that's uncomfortable. So um, if it's not their own system, what they're struggling against is the authority of it. Um, and it, it may be uncomfortable and or intimidating to them to, to walk into a church and, you know, feel like that they're surrounded by a lot of people who are self-righteous and uh, hypocrites. You know, that's that's a good red flag word there. Mm. Um, you know, and that, that these people are probably not living up to what they're what they're saying in this church. And, you know, so so why should I? Right. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, and then from there, I'd like to move on into the the next type of skepticism, uh, which in your book, the order is moral skepticism. Uh, what what type of objections would be moral in nature? Those would be uh, moral skepticism is a lot about wordplay and and it's a lot of self defeating types of things like truth depends on your perspective. Um, you know the retort the quick retort would be is that your perspective? Um, you know gotcha. there's this thing is absolute truth. You know of course is that absolute truth that sort of thing. Um, that's a good comeback. That's really not. That doesn't get you any further. All that does is maybe make them a little bit uh, frustrated with you by pointing that out. Um, a good God wouldn't send you to heaven. That's, I mean, wouldn't send you to hell. Uh, that's another one. That sort of sounds biblical because you're mentioning God or even spiritual. But really, the, the problem is they're, they're indicting God's character. A good God wouldn't send anyone to hell. Mm. So they're saying, that's bad. You know, well, why is that bad? Based on what? Based on your standard? Right, because gotcha. Because people have different standards, so whose standard should we live by? Um, those types of things. Anything that's related to sexual behavior, of course, would be huge because people like to defend uh, their own behavior, um, and they like to hide from that if it's if it's pointed out that if you say, you know, I think abortion is wrong, um, and they're a pro-abortion, or maybe they've even had an abortion, mm. um, they may be very sensitive to that uh, and and want to to defend it uh, more out of emotion than anything else. Gotcha. So is, this is more, uh, so the problem here ultimately is moral relativism. Is that what I'm hearing with this type of skepticism? That's right. That's right. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Um, I noticed at the start of the section you quoted John Lennon um, as saying, all we're saying is give peace a chance, and you used the peace symbol to represent moral skepticism. Um, what were you thinking there with uh, peace somehow being tied mm-hmm. into moral relativism? Mm-hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, the, the really what some, someone who is a moral relativist is essentially saying is, I do what I, I'll, I'll do what I want to do, you do what you want to do, and let's not judge each other, and we'll all get along. Mm. So, you know, there, there will be peace and harmony if we just live and let live. But the problem is, what I want to do and what you want to do will eventually conflict. So then who is the moral referee? Unless there is a moral referee, unless there is a fixed standard, then, it's, then, then how this is going to be resolved is whoever is stronger might determines right. Gotcha. Uh, the strongest will survive. I'm going, if I'm stronger, I'm eventually going to impose my view on you somehow, politically, economically, whatever that is, if I can. So it's might versus right, and that's not a very har- harmonious uh, ultimate result. No. So uh, they, they say they want peace, but the way they want it will never get them there. It will be uh, really more enslaving than it, would, than it would be liberating because yep. it would be might versus right instead of respect for a, a particular standard. Right, which I guess is where you were saying in your book there is no such thing as a pure relativist, um, and you said that only those uh, who pose as relativists in order to sound morally superior, politically correct. Um, so based on what you said, like when you share that with them, how, how do you convey this to a moral relativist? Like, Do you just say it as you said it to me, or um, if you do get them to that point of recognizing this, where do they usually go from there in the conversation? Mm-hmm. Um, if, like I was saying earlier, if you just point out that they're using self-defeated language, self-defeating language, that may prove the point, but it mm-hmm. may not earn you um, any credit with them. Um, you know, and, and I think a good way to say that is, look, you know, I'm, I'm not playing word games with you here. That's just the way truth works. Um, I have to live by it, and so do you. Uh, the difference is we have to to both recognize that there is a truth that does exist. It, you, whether you you say you believe in absolute truth or not, you, you are holding something back. You are standing on some um, life standard, some moral standard, and that to you is an absolute. So, um, you know, if, if you're sincere in what you say that you want people to get along, then... You know, hey, why don't we acknowledge that if we're going to get along, let's let's abide by the same standard. Um, and then that's kind of a segue to, okay, you can't have a fixed standard unless there is a transcendent objective standard. Right. Um, so, so then you're going to run into some resistance with them there again. Most likely, if you suggest that, you know, I believe, and there's nothing wrong with saying this, you know. Um, you can say you can believe you're, you're welcome to disagree with me, but I believe that standard comes from uh, a holy, personal, loving God, and and those rules are not uh, for us to you know lose all the joy out of life. It's it's to free us. Um, you know his his uh, objective is for our own good, so he's not some cosmic buzzkill out there by setting up rules. Yeah, um, he sets them up for our own good. Like. The like our parents give us laws out of love. They they give us rules to follow for our betterment. Um, and then exactly. when we have kids, we pass on rules too because we're we're love we love our children as well. Yeah, really a good approach on that. Um, and then the the next type of skepticism was scientific skepticism. Um, and I, I think I have a good example of what this sometimes plays out as um, in, in the Jack Black movie Nacho Libre. Have you seen that movie? I know which one you're talking about, but I haven't seen it. Okay, so there's like a scene in there with his wrestling partner where the wrestling partner won't won't pray with him beforehand because he doesn't believe in God. Um, And then the partner ends up pulling later like the whole, kind of pulls the moral card, but also then moves into the scientific one where it says, oh, you're always judging me because I only believe in science. Um, Is that what this type of skepticism is, being being skeptical of God because... Uh, God can't be submitted to scientific testing? I, I think that's part of it. Um, yeah, naturalism or materialism, believing that uh, there is 
nothing but this world, the natural world is all that there is. Um, but I think everyone believes in the supernatural one way or the other. Mm. Um, and and a, a scientifically minded person, of course, will resist that idea. Um, but you know, you go all the way back to the beginning. I mean, we can argue the ins and outs of evolution all you want, Big Bang theory, quantum physics, all of that stuff. It, it comes down to first principles. Uh, you know, you either believe in an irrational, you either have an irrational faith that nothing is the cause of everything, and that violates all sorts of logical uh, principles, or you believe that something with the power of being within itself, something that is not contingent, started everything. Mm. That's also faith. Both sides are, uh, have faith. But that is a logical, uh, rational appeal to faith because you're putting that uh, cause in the hands of something capable of carrying it out. Um, so it's, it's, it's sort of calling them on acknowledging that we're both using faith. And it's, it's, it's a very tough thing. Uh, my, my probing question there is how much faith is required for that belief? Um, and they will say, what faith? I'm a scientist. I'm, I'm relying on science. I have evidence. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes and no. But, but exactly, and evidence is an important word because they'll say, you know, I follow the evidence wherever it leads. But the point is, evidence doesn't lead. Evidence sits there and waits to be interpreted by someone who has a philosophical bias. Right. Or a worldview. And within that worldview, you're assuming things, especially if you're looking at things that happened in the past, like an evolved animal or the Big Bang or whatever it is. If you're looking in, into the past, then you can't witness it. You can't directly witness it. So you're, you're resting your scientific calculations on some assumptions. And when you do that, when you're resting it on assumptions, that's where faith creeps in. Because you're assuming some things based on your prior held beliefs. And so that's, it's not denominational faith, but it's faith in, uh, in, the way that it's uh, believing in something that you can't see, um, so it's it's in their worldview as well. Yeah, it's really good. I actually really like the section on information as a red flag word on this one. Uh, I, I think I learned the most from that section. You shared that information isn't material, so they're basing their whole life on the material, or everything's <laughs> everything's uh, physical or material. And you're like, well, information isn't, and information can't come from randomness and then you showed how information on the dna level can't produce new information and that that was the part that was really new to me i i didn't realize that and i was just talking to a fellow teacher that teaches biology and he was mentioning yeah that's that's absolutely true um and that information is only rearranged or degraded or both um so i think for me that's one i really took away as a talking point uh with people on that one right um, yeah, the, uh, that's sort of an intelligent design argument. Um, and, you know, information is one of those, one of those things that a scientifically minded skeptic would borrow from a believer. Right. Uh, even the belief that the universe has any order at all. Why should they believe that? It's right. all a matter of randomness and chance, and it shouldn't have this finely tuned, um, aspect that it does. Uh, so they're borrowing that from us. They're, they're assuming a lot of things to, to get the worldview started. Right. They have to dip into the theistic worldview to even practice right. the scientific method, um, which is something you, you mentioned in there that for them, they have to make nature do the supernatural. They're denying the supernatural, but they're making what's natural be supernatural by being able to produce life itself, which... I just really love that section. So we're going to have to take a break now. Uh, so when we return, we'll look at the fourth type of skepticism in the book, which is the one that is my favorite to speak with people about, which is uh, biblical skepticism. So when we return, uh, we'll dig into biblical skepticism, and then from there, do some role play with Bill. Uh, I'll do my best to play as a skeptic and just see how he would respond to certain one-liners that we'll often probably hear uh, from the world and the people that we interact with. Daily. Hey there, come check out blueeyedshyguy.blogspot.com where I write about faith, family, and philosophy. Topics range from comparative religion, the nature of God through science and reasoning, 
and even open discussions on difficult social topics such as same-sex marriage and abortion. Each post is written with love and a desire to relate biblical principles with clarity. That's blueeyedshyguy.blogspot.com or you can visit facebook.com slash blueeyedshyguy where I post encouraging thoughts, scriptures, and original memes. And if you can't remember any of that, no worries. You can just Google Blue Eyed Shy Guy and click whatever comes up. You might even find my YouTube channel where I make videos with my family. Any way you want to find me, you'll be glad you did. Welcome back to Reconnect. I'm your host, Andy Rasman. This is the inaugural show, and I have Bill Foster with me, author of Meet the Skeptic, a field guide to faith conversations. And you can find more of Bill's work at fosteronfaith.com. And we've already gone through three types of skepticism that we'll commonly face, spiritual skepticism, moral skepticism, and scientific skepticism. And now we'll turn to biblical skepticism. And Bill, what's this form of skepticism? Uh, the biblical skepticism, for me, is a little bit different than the way some apologists handle it. Uh, I think apologists like Josh McDowell and Lee Strobel, uh, which who have great books. I mean, you know, they're 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 fantastic apologists, Christian thinkers. Uh, they give you manuscript evidence and the reliability of the Bible and and that sort of thing, which is great. And I didn't try to rewrite that because you know, hey, they, who, who can who, who can, can beat it, right? They, <laughs> That's right. They, I, they don't need me to be try to be Josh McDowell. You know, I'm, I'm not him. So, um, so, so my take on it, and this it probably comes a little bit from my occupation from the graphic design marketing world, um, oddly enough, which is perception. Uh, a person's perception of the Bible is really what drives their understanding of it more than their actual knowledge of the Bible. Most people, including Christians, don't read the Bible very much. Uh, sadly, and uh, a skeptic is most of the time parroting an objection that they've heard someone else say. They haven't read the context of something that Paul said, right. or something in Genesis, or something in Leviticus, you know, an Old Testament law. They have no idea about the context of that. And so you saying, oh, well, you know, giving them the context, saying, well, you know, in that chapter, what Paul is actually talking about was X, Y, Z. They don't, they're don't. they not going to know. They're not going to care because they just don't have enough to go on there. So I think I, what I do is back up and say, look, what they're doing is judging the book by its cover. Mm. Uh, and, and the cover of the Bible for them is something that's old and out of date and intolerant and that sort of thing. Um, and so... You know, you know, hey, okay, that's that's fine if you think that, you know, but, but say, okay, look at what the Bible claims to be. You know, the Bible claims to be the Word of God. You know, it claims to be the supernatural book. So if it claims that, then how would we know that that is true? You know, if, if you were going to create a supernatural book or if you if you have any, any ideas about how that should be done, what, how, what do you think that would look like? You know, that, that way you're kind of getting their opinion and you're calling them out on, well, you know, your assumption is that it's not a supernatural book. What would it take to make you believe that it was? What, what criteria are you, are you going by, or, or are there any criteria? So if you ask those questions, what, are they usually, like, what do you usually hear back from them? Um, have they when, even considered it? Uh, no, no, most people have not considered that. Um, I, I actually had a conversation with a buddy of mine who I played tennis with, um, and he is, uh, he's from Bulgaria, and a uh, really nice guy, and um, we, were, we were talking about this one of the first few times we played, and it moved from a scientific conversation to the, this biblical conversation. Um, and, and he said, I said, you know, um, a, a book that's supernatural would not only have to be honest about people and about history, I mean, you know, there are plenty of books that do that. Um, you know, it would have to make some supernatural type of, create or provide some supernatural type of evidence. Uh, and he says, is there such a book? Hmm. <laughs> and I said, you know, I think there is. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's the Bible. And, I, you know, I, I gave him a couple of examples of prophecies. Uh, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, well, it's obvious that, you know, these prophecies are written after the fact. I mean, there's nothing supernatural about that. But, but. You know, it's pretty easy to determine that they weren't. Uh, people speak differently over hundreds of years. You know, they write differently. They're, you know, even in our culture, 
Uh, you go back a hundred years and you look at the language, or a couple hundred, you know, the founding father's language is very different than ours. Uh, the, the same way with reading something out of Daniel or Ezekiel or, um, you know, some, any of the Isaiah, some of the prophetic books, uh, you know, they predict things that happen hundreds of years later. And right. so we would know if it was written after the fact, because if somebody wrote that down in that time, then it would look much different. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you really don't have to get that deep into it if you, if you don't know that kind of thing. I mean, that's the whole point of the book, is, is to get them talk, talking about, um, you know, why they don't believe, because a lot of people haven't thought through it. Yeah, to make them skeptical of their own skepticism, maybe? That's right. Okay, interesting. Uh, with what you just shared with your friend, that idea of, well, how would you know uh, what a religious book would look like? And they don't really have an answer. You, you usually go with prophecy there, right? Is, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, well, the, the way I break it down in my book is that there are there are two ordinary reasons, and then there are two extraordinary reasons to believe the Bible is not a man-made book. The ordinary reasons were the two that I mentioned about the uh, honesty it's honest about people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's honest about people. It, you know, it, it gives them gives a, the um, profiles of them, good and bad. You know, all the the people of God, Abraham, David, um, Jonah. Yeah, they all had their bad points, and the Bible points that out. Yeah, seriously uh, flawed that. individuals. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, just like us. <laughs> and, uh, uh, history. Um, you, know, you can't you can't stick a shovel in the ground in the Middle East without digging something up that backs up what the Bible says about mm. all of these cultures, Assyria and Babylon and Greece and Rome and all of these kings. Um, there's tons there uh, that back up what the Bible has to say. So, so it's. It is uh, solid in what it says in those two aspects. And the, the other two, um, the extraordinary, is um, the, it predicts future events well in advance, specifically predicts them, not in a general way like some of the, the psychics mm. uh, you know, in recent years have done, but in a specific way. Uh, and the fourth would be that it is, and this is the hardest one to unpack because they'll immediately dismiss it, is... Um, that it's incredibly consistent from Old Testament to New Testament. Right. A lot of people think the God of the Old Testament is, you know, mean and um, unforgiving, and that Jesus is loving. But you know, not so. Yeah, you know, they're not. You're not reading very much about what Jesus had to say to the Pharisees and to, you know, the people in his day. If you if you see it that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there, and plus, the, one of my favorite studies, and this is this would maybe over the heads of someone who's not familiar with with church and the Bible, is you know the typologies, you know the pictures of Christ in the Old Testament that are that are amazing, uh, from from Abraham and Isaac to Joseph uh, to to the Exodus, um, you know, crossing the Red Sea. You know, that's that's sort of a picture of baptism, going into the Promised Land. That's a picture of the fruitful uh, Christian life. Um, all of these things, the, the, you get these pictures in, in actual events yeah. of spiritual principles in the New Testament. All of the um, festivals. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All of that. You know, you, you get in there, and that just goes on and on. Um, but again, that that wouldn't be the first one I would bring up. Right. But it, but it is fascinating after you maybe if you have a relationship with with your skeptical friend to say, you know, we've been talking Bible a lot lately. Let me show you something neat. Let me read Psalm twenty two to you. Or, 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 or don't don't show them. I've done this with with uh, Mormons before. I, I have a portion of Psalm twenty two copied and put in a separate page and in my Bible. Mm-hmm. And I say, let me read this to you. And you tell me where it came from. And undoubtedly, without a doubt, they'll say, "Oh, well, that's Jesus on the cross. That's the crucifixion." Right. It says, "You know, my bones are out of joint. My hands and feet are pierced, et cetera, et cetera. A band of evil men encircled me." And I say, no, it actually isn't. It, it, that's what David said. You know, it was written 500 years before crucifixion was even invented. Right. So what do you do with that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and like you know, you're saying, it's seamless one. between there to the New Testament. And I, I, I think it's a good argument. We don't usually use that. And maybe it's, it's a lot easier to share that in a conversation on the golf course instead of going into, like you were saying, all the historical evidence for the documentation sure. and then the resurrection of Christ, which I, I, I usually still go there for myself first and foremost because I think that's where salvation lies. But I think what you're uh-huh. sharing is a really good one that's easy for people to use because we could easily, uh, I, I think they would probably very quickly agree with you when you share, oh yeah, it's 
the the Bible seamless. This many authors across this many years, uh, and they don't contradict each other. When in the history of mankind have you ever seen such agreement on religion? Ever, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that's right. Yeah, the Buddha comes along, yeah, yeah. contradicts Hinduism. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you know, the, the manuscript thing. Most people don't know what a manuscript is. They right. don't understand, you know, that we have fragments and uh, portions of, you know, in all sorts of languages, and that's how we get the Bible we have today. People don't get that, so that, that's a little bit of an academic uh, question for most people. So I, I try to avoid that one, too, unless I know them a little bit better. Yeah, that's 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 good. Um, well, let me try to do some role play with you on these, just see... Uh, how how you would respond not not to try to stump you but just so our listeners can kind of get how some of this would be put into practice in the field uh so if you hear god is an irrational crutch people use to explain things they don't understand okay um what what's irrational about it about him uh he can't be seen he's an invisible daddy in the sky Okay, so there are, there are a lot of things that can't be seen, right? I mean, if you're, would you would you say that if you don't believe in God, do you believe there was a Big Bang, or how do, how do you think we got here? I have no clue how we got here. I just know we are. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm really I mean, dodging that one, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, but that's 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 a very realistic answer <laughs> from um, a lot of people, I, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they don't they don't care. I mean, it's it's just you know how we're here. But but if they're posing the question, if they're thinking enough to pose the question, then then they should consider what that question entails. Right. Um, just because you can't see it, you know, like you said, you could even mention uh, information again. There are plenty of things that that you can't see, taste, touch, whatever, that are nonetheless real. Mm. Um, so um, it, it sounds like. The, the objection you brought up there is more of a scientific type of, or something that a scientific person would say, or an angry atheist. Right. Um, so, uh, going down that road, uh, would, you know, would you say you have any sort of faith, and and then unpack a few of the things? What you know, it sounds like you have faith that you know we came from nothing, and that um, one creature became another kind of creature, even though we don't have any. We can't see that that ever happens. That's another thing we couldn't see. So that's by faith and life came from non-life we've never seen that so that's by faith so it sounds like you have a lot of faith yeah it's <laughs> so good different kinds of faith so you know. yeah that's good um what, what about this one i don't believe it's possible for any one person or religion to hold a monopoly on the truth mm-hmm. um a monopoly on the truth yeah i actually um, got that wording from a a Unitarian Universalist um, <laughs> video. Yeah. That, that was his wording, a monopoly on the truth. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh-huh. So why are you a Unitarian? Uh, let's see. Put, put my mind on Unitarian because I don't think any of us can know ultimate truth concerning God and that it's something that we all can experience on a personal level. Um, and so each person's truth may be different. Okay. Would you say that's an ultimate truth? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, how would we know? Um, you know, if we, uh, the only way to say something about uh, not, we can't know everything about God is to know everything about God. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, there, that's, I, I would think, yeah, Unitarian would, would kind of shade, it, that's kind of, Bridges the uh, or, or straddles the fence between spiritual and moral because it's it's relativistic, um, but it and those go together. They they really do. The the, the moral and the spiritual kind of go together, um, but it, it's a relativistic sort of worldview because they don't want to say that anything is right. And so you know we're Unitarians. We don't think that anything is right. Well, that's an absolute. Mm. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't think any one religion should have a monopoly. That sounds like a monopoly to me, that you believe that no religion should have a monopoly on the truth. Sounds Good. like you're trying to have a monopoly on the truth, because if I disagree with you, you're going to tell me I'm wrong. Good. So this is this is almost falling into that moral category, seeking peace where there actually isn't peace. 
or they're uh-huh. they're they're acting peaceful, but really they're they're forcing their agenda so where no one else can believe what that's they that's recognize that's to be true. It. Yeah, good, uh-huh. really good approach on that one. Let's just do one more on these. Um, this this is one I've I've seen a lot of the new atheists throw out there. Um, you're a Christian, right? And you answer, yeah. And then this thing is, so you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he turned water into wine, that he walked on water, was crucified, buried, and raised three days later. You've got to be kidding me. Mm-hmm. Like any That's person right. in the 21st century, you still believe that mumbo jumbo from, <laughs> you know, first century backwater Israel. Right. Um, and, and again, I would go, I would probably go, again, that's, that's kind of the, your, your atheistic guy. Uh, I would go back to, and you believe that life came from a rock and that the universe came from nothing and that an amoeba became a man. You've got to be kidding me. Um, sounds like there's a lot of faith there. Sounds like we both have faith again. Right. Um, uh, but you know, the thing is, you know, you got to be careful, and I have to watch this too because I'm competitive. Mm. Hey, you know, I like to win as much as anybody does. Um, but you have to be careful how you come back like that. Your tone is so important. Uh, you know, it, because they're they're not your enemy. Right. They're you know, they're your potential brother. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know, especially if you know them. If you don't know them, it's a little tougher. But but if you know them, I I, I have a, a good friend. I've known him since fourth grade. He's an atheist. Um, we're we're great friends. And you know, we can talk about this stuff, um, but you can't do that with everybody. So you know, uh, being, being respectful in, in how you come back with that, it, it, being good natured about it, you can point out absurdity, I think, in a good natured way. Right. Which I like the way you do it in your book. You you give us questions to ask, and they're just probing uh-huh. questions that should lead the person to really consider um, how they would respond to that. Um, and hopefully, then, even if it's not you presenting the gospel, maybe their maybe their friend, if if it's not someone that you're well acquainted with, they'll bring it up later, or will open the door for another believer in that person's life to um, get a better response to the gospel when they get to share it. So it's really cool. Yeah, and you know, too, I, I think. You know, a lot of people will will ask when they interview me about my book about you know, well, what do you say when? You know, as if they're kind of expecting the perfect answer. You know, here's the answer to that question. Right. And that's not really what my book is about. My book is about making the other person think about it. Mm-hmm. You're, you're not going to convert them overnight because they didn't become a skeptic overnight. Right. So, you know, the expectations are, are much different um, than thinking you're going to convert them. Uh, you, you're not going to convert them at all. That That's a Holy Spirit thing. All you can do is expose them to truth and leave it there. Right. It's okay if they didn't if they didn't agree with you and they didn't you know turn on a dime because even if I think a lot of times they they might actually agree with you but they're not going to let you know that. Yeah. I wouldn't. You know that's a pride thing. Yeah. So yeah, that's okay if you were respectful, you kept it good natured. Hey, you know, next time you, you may have earned another opportunity. That's what you want. You just extended the dialogue. So right. The book's about extending the dialogue. Right, and I always like to present the gospel, even if it's only in a sentence or two at some point, just because I know that's the power that to save. That's right, yeah. Um, I'm just curious then, so like you already mentioned you have a, you have a friend uh, that's a really good friend from fourth grade that's an atheist. You mentioned playing golf with someone that's coming up. Uh, where, is, where is most of your faith-based, uh, faith-based conversations come into play um, that you – got essentially the experience and material for this book? Uh, for, for me, since I, I don't work in an office, I work for myself, so I, it's not like I have a bunch of coworkers that I'm milling around you know, over the water cooler you know, every day, and, and that's great. My wife has those types of conversations mm-hmm. uh, quite often that, that just come out uh, you know, when she's on a sales call or something. But um, for me, it's a little bit different. I'm not around that many people during the day, so I, I do have my, my tennis you know, circle of friends, some are believers, some are not. Um, I get into online conversations, um, posting something um, on a blog or Facebook or, or something. Sometimes it may it may even be a political issue, which is a very tough thing to transition because uh, tempers get heated very quickly over politics. Yeah. And trying to follow that up with, with the spirit.
spiritual truth, you know, or a presentation of the gospel is, is almost impossible. Um, so uh, I, I've lately tried to be very careful about um, how much I post. It, it's it's kind of the, uh, the the blogging thing and the the online chatting is is pretty tough um, way to do it. I'd much rather do it face to face. Me too. Uh, and, and being intentional about it, going uh, going out and sharing sharing your faith. We did this with high school students this summer at a summer camp we do with uh, students from our church. We did a beach reach, and you, know, you go out and 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 say, you know, hey, you know, we're we're out here. We've been challenged to um, share our faith, and you know, what do you think about the word gospel? If I say the word gospel, what does that mean to you? And and a lot of times that conversation, what we found. It, it goes to the the good works get you to heaven sort of response. Right, it's what most people um, think, right? Yeah, yeah, they believe. Well, Jesus was great, you know, but now it's up to me. <laughs> no, you know, no, he, he he didn't just open the door and say you take it from here. He he took care of it, and now the gospel is what empowers you to do the good works in response, not as a way to get there. Um, so you know, the more things you do, the more opportunities you have. Uh, do, doing, uh, working at a, 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 we do a Halloween carnival where we engage the public. We do give away a bunch of prizes and things, and we ask them questions. And um, you know, it, there's there's no problem walking up to someone uh, like you said. Don't be afraid to share the gospel. Mm. Um, you know, that's never out of bounds. Uh, don't don't think that something simple, that simple, is going to be lost on somebody because not everybody is a a heady academic skeptic. And, and even with them, maybe they've never heard a simple presentation of what the gospel means. It's right. really pretty reasonable when you think about it. Yeah, absolutely. It's not something strange. Yeah, and, and and oftentimes it really is good news when you present it to them because they're familiar with what you just said, like, good works get you to heaven. Jesus did this much, then I do the rest. And it's like, no, that's not it. And you get to share the uh-huh. actual gospel that he died for all of your sins and that his righteousness is your righteousness, it's actually good news. They're like, oh, really? Is that what Christians actually believe? And you're like, yeah, it is, actually. <laughs> right. It's not footloose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's Eric Metaxas who says, um, you know, n- never be surprised by really how little the other side knows. I mean, you, you may think that they, are, they could be a very intelligent person, but they really don't know what the actual gospel is, what Jesus really said, and... Uh, some things that we take for granted if you grew up in church. You know, we just don't even think about it. Um, you know, don't be surprised if, if something that basic actually has an effect. Yeah, awesome. Um, speaking on where you get into your conversations with, I, I saw you're located in North Carolina, and uh-huh. I've, I've recently noticed a lot is popping up in North Carolina for sharing the gospel and defending it. Um, Frank Turek's out there, I believe, of Cross Examine. Uh, Bobby Conaway, he's got a website on YouTube called The One Minute Apologist, and then you're out there, and I believe Ratio Christie centered out there. Am I, am I correct on that? That a lot of the leaders are in North Carolina. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. Ratio Christie. I think the first chapter was in at Appalachian State, um, and we had a conference for Ratio Christie last fall in Charlotte. Uh, Hank Hanegraaff, the Bible Answer Man, is in Charlotte. He, he used to be at, in, in your neck of the woods in California. Uh, Norm Geisler. Uh, a lot of these, the guys that you mentioned, are affiliated with Norm Geisler and Southern Evangelical Seminary. Uh, and that's an apologetic seminary. So that's why a lot of them are in the Charlotte area. Gotcha. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, I, I was curious about that. I, I didn't know if there was uh, a, a big move away from Christianity taking place in that area of the country or not, if that's why it was. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Maybe that's right here. I don't know. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, thanks so much uh, for talking to me and being on the show. Uh, for for all the listeners, Bill Foster uh, was the guest here. His book is Meet the Skeptic. You can go to his website at uh, fosteronfaith.com. And what's the website for your branding design company? It is billfosterdesign.com. BillFosterDesign.com. There you have it, guys. Uh, Please check into that and keep following and listening to Reconnect and look forward to having more shows with all of you. God bless. You're missing.
mission, if you choose to accept it, share this episode on all of your social media sites and with your email contacts, people who will benefit from listening to the show. Thank you for listening. Reconnect us, O oh Lord.